This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org. Aloha, and welcome to the monthly public presentation of the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. Since 1990, the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii has been following our mission of promoting human health, animal rights, and protection of the environment by means of vegetarian education, as we've grown to become one of the largest all-volunteer nonprofit vegetarian societies in the nation. It's now time for our special guest, we're delighted to have with us tonight Dr. John Westerdahl, Ph.D. John Westerdahl, Ph.D., MPH, R.D., CNS, and FAMD, is the chair of the Vegetarian Nutrition Dietetic Practice Group of the AMD. He is the director of the Bragg Health Institute and director of health science for Bragg Live Food Products in Santa Barbara, California. He lived for many years in Hawaii, right here. He's even taught for us before here. We really miss him. <laughs> anyway, he uh, not only lived here for many years, but he also formerly served as Director of Wellness and Lifestyle Medicine and Nutritional Services for Castle Medical Center and served as President of the Hawaii Nutrition Council. A graduate of Pacific Union College and Loma Linda University School of Public Health, Dr. Westerdahl's Bachelor of Science, Master of Public Health, and Doctorate degrees are in the fields of food, nutrition, and health education. He has worked as a nutritionist and health scientist for companies such as Dr. McDougall Wright Foods, Inc., Sheckley Corp., uh, Veggie Life Magazine, Millennium Restaurant, and Murad, Inc., and is co-author of the Millennium Cookbook, Extraordinary Vegetarian Cuisine. His national radio talk show, Health and Longevity, is broadcast weekly on the live, I'm sorry, on the live, <laughs> on the Life Talk radio network. That would be at www.healthandlongevityradio.com. And Dr. Westerdahl's presentation tonight is entitled, Vegetarian Diets, the Latest Evidence-Based Nutritional Science. Please join me in welcoming Dr. John Westerdahl. Great. Thank you, Lorraine. Thank you. Move this microphone over. Oh, OK. Well, aloha. Well, it's really nice to be here in Hawaii again. This is. I feel more at home here than anywhere else in the world, really. And uh, I would say the best, many of the best years of my career were here in Hawaii. As many of you know, I work at Castle Medical Center in, here in Kailua and uh, served as the wellness director, wellness lifestyle medicine and nutrition director there for a number of years. And uh, of course, Castle is affiliated with the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Seventh-day Adventist, uh, we call it Adventist Health Hospital. Uh, which promotes a plant-based diet. And the cafeteria is all vegetarian. How many hospitals can you say do that? Let's give Castle a hand. So it was a wonderful experience in promoting plant-based nutrition here in Hawaii. And then, of course, I did the radio show on KWAI Radio. At that time, we called it Nutrition and You. Dr. Shintani is carrying on that program. And that radio show, I started with Dr. McDougall way back in the 80s. And then he moved and gave me the radio show to do, and we carried it on. It's the longest running health talk radio show in Hawaii still today. So we want to thank Dr. Shintani for carrying that on. 
Well, um, a lot of things have happened uh, over the years now. Uh, they mentioned I was with Bragg Live Food Products. Patricia Bragg, how many of you use, use Bragg products? I know a lot of the uh, vegetarians, of course, almost everyone uses the products. And so my daytime job really is I do two things. I have, uh, I'm director of health science and that's research and development for, for the food company, Bragg Life Food Products, and developing healthy food products that are vegetarian and vegan. And then I also uh, am the director of the Bragg Health Institute, which is our nonprofit division of the Bragg organization, designed to help reach and promote health and nutrition and wellness and total health to people of all ages. And then this year I was, be, was very honored to be elected. I'm a registered dietitian nutritionist and and very active in the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics and they elected me to be the chair of the Vegetarian Nutrition Dietetic Practice Group of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. Now let me explain what that is. That um, used to be called the American Dietetic Association. Maybe many of you remember that name and just a few years ago um, they saw the interest in more growing in nutrition and uh, sometimes dietetics just sounds like just for dietitians. So they changed the name to the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. And if you'd like to learn more about uh, the organization, go to www.eatright.org and there's a lot of great information on there. I won't say it's all vegetarian, but uh, it is a good source of reliable nutrition information that you can get. Now, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics is actually the world's largest organization of food and nutrition professionals in the whole world. This is the largest organization. There's over 75,000 members, the majority of which are registered dietitian nutritionists, and then also dietetic technicians, which are assistants in hospitals to dietitians, uh, other dietetic professionals, and students who are going into the field of nutrition and dietetics. So this is a great organization. Uh, it is, a, it, I guess you could call it almost like the AMA of the nutritionist profession, the registered dietitian. And there's some controversy as, as a result of that because um, having gone into study to become a registered dietitian, I knew that you know a lot of people in those days think of registered dietitians as someone that's uh, just making hospital food. How healthy is hospital food usually, except for Castle, right? Uh, it's not always thought of being the healthiest and registered dietitians have uh, had the reputation sometimes they are nutrition experts they have the uh, advanced science degrees and so forth in nutrition but um, not teaching exactly what uh, many of us here in this group would consider is what what optimal health is now first of all let me explain what a registered dietitian nutritionist is first of all to be a registered dietitian, you have to go through a very extensive uh, program of at least four, minimum of four years of college in uh, taking courses in nutrition and dietetics. There's a, a prescribed program of courses that have to be taken. And uh, then in addition to that, the registered dietitian has to spend a good time in doing uh, a clinical internship or externship somewhere in a hospital, medical center, training, uh, working with uh, patients in the clinical setting, learning that is also also learning uh, food management and so forth for hospitals and institutions and learning administrative dietetics too. So it's a very comprehensive education program and then uh, not only do they have to do the clinical internship for a number for a year, at least a year and then they go on to take a national board exam which is a very uh, tough exam to pass and um, so that's to be the a registered dietitian so that's a four-year degree of course many people go on like myself went on to get a master's degree and then later on a doctorate as well but they have changed the name it used to be just called registered dietitian and now you're going to hear the term registered dietitian nutritionist more and the, part of the reason that it's going to be RDN, not just RD, and that is because uh, today there's a lot of people out there saying I'm a certified nutritionist or I'm a clinical nutritionist or I have this credential or whatever and a lot of those courses are not really 
that sophisticated. There's some of them are home study courses you can do through the mail, get a certificate, they claim they're a nutritionist, but they really have not had the educational level that a registered dietitian has had. So that is why they are now turning the name to registered dietitian nutritionist. By the way, do we have any nutri registered dietitians, nutritionists here in the audience today? Okay. Now, in the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, dietitians like to specialize in certain areas. Some of them are diabetes dietitians. Some of them are cardiovascular nutritionists. Some of them are interested in a, a pr practice group which I actually help found is in integrative medicine and functional foods. Uh, there are other ones that are specializing in just weight management. Some are uh, in business and communication. There's many different uh, categories that you, when you become a member of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics that you can specialize in. And one of the groups, which I feel is really probably the most important group within the whole Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, is the Vegetarian Nutrition Dietetic Practice Group of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. That is a group of dietitians that want to specialize in the area of vegetarian nutrition, studying vegetarian diets, vegan diets, plant-based diets, phytochemicals, not that all the dietitians that join it are vegetarian necessarily, but they in, have that interest. Most of them probably are because they, they're looking to, to be with other dietitians with a like mind. But uh, we're trying to encourage all dietitians to become a member of this group because even if they're not focused in, sometimes they think, well, I'm not a vegetarian, so I can't be a member. And I say, no, we want you to be a member because we are the leading group of experts focused on plant-based diets, which everyone's talking about, and phytochemicals and other things about plant foods that can help prevent, treat, and even reverse disease. Now the mission of the Vegetarian Nutrition Dietetic Practice Group of the Academy is that it's to serve its members, and it's done so for over 22 years now, and the members practice in various settings, from hospitals to academic institutions, long-term care facilities, rehabilitation centers, home health, outpatient clinics, diabetes centers, private practice, grocery stores, locations. And I, I think in my career, I've done a lot of different things. I've been a d nutritionist and dietitian in a hospital setting. I've worked for vegetarian food companies. Uh, I've worked for nutritional supplement companies. I've worked as a nutrition editor for Veggie Life magazine, which is a vegetarian magazine. I've done radio. I've done television. So I, I, I'm very interested in getting the message out about plant-based and vegetarian diets in many ways. And uh, so I have a real passion for it. So that's people wonder, how did you do all those different things? It's just I like that variety of experiences. I think it's a, it helps broaden your perspective on things and reaches a lot of people. So our mission for the Vegetarian Practice Group of the, the Academy is to empower members to be the leading authorities on evidence-based vegetarian nutrition for food and nutrition professionals, healthcare professionals, and the public. So we have a little different mission. It's not just to promote, uh, we, we have an, uh, you know, concerns because a lot of dietitians, unfortunately, don't know a lot about vegetarian nutrition. So we want to educate them about it and other health professionals, but we also want to reach out to the general public and giving good evidence-based, scientific, latest research information on plant-based diets. Our vision as the leading authorities on evidence-based vegetarian nutrition our vision is to optimize global health and well-being by creating and disseminating vegetarian nutrition educational materials, uh, nutrition education materials, supporting cutting-edge research, and developing influential policy. And, uh, and we have people on our committee that are at, in Washington, they're meeting in the Capitol, they're, uh, you know, in th this national organization of dietitians, the beef industry, the dairy industry has a lot of influence. The animal food product companies and the lobbyists are trying to work with dietitians to convince them that these are he really healthy foods and they give a lot of money to the organization and so forth. And yet we're, we're trying to counteract a lot of that and give, tell people about the power of plant foods and vegetarian diets for their patients that they work with. 
Now, one of the publications that we put out, and I'm one of the editors of this, is called Vegetarian Nutrition Update. And this is a regular newsletter that goes to all the members of this practice group to keep them updated on the cutting edge information regarding vegetarian nutrition. Now, an interesting thing uh, happened this year under my, my leadership. One of the things we do is we come out every five years with an official position paper on vegetarian diets. And this position paper is this latest state of the art, state of the science information regarding vegetarian nutrition. It's a document that some of you probably have seen or used that you can really give to doctors and other health professionals who question, oh, vegetarian nutrition, it's not the, you know, there's problems with that type of diet and this and that. And this document really supports the science behind what we're all trying to teach here at the Vegetarian Society about the power of plant-based diets. Well, in May, uh, we came out with our official position paper, and the last one was in 2009. And it was quite interesting because we had some science writers, and they don't let me know who writes these articles or who, who's even on the committee. And it's really top secret until it's published in the journal. And what happened is this position paper came out, and the moment it came out, a number of the leading experts in vegetarian nutrition and scientists who have studied vegetarian nutrition tore this position paper apart felt that it wasn't written well, there were omissions, there was fault, there was information that was not as scientific as it could be. They just pulled the whole paper apart and as a result of it, and to my knowledge, the first time in history the Academy has uh, pulled that paper and say we are not going to accept it even though it was published in the journal, we all saw it, and they said we're going to have it all rewritten. So this was a, a big blow to the organization and we don't know how it really got all the way through the review process, but a new paper is being written and I can t assure you that that paper will be probably the strongest scientific paper ever uh, in the history on vegetarian nutrition that we can use and the other one will be rejected. So that's kind of an interesting thing that happened in, in, within this organization. Now, the Academy has said for now, for the time being, go back to the 2009 paper, which was an outstanding paper. It was uh, really well written and had the really cutting edge science. And that's what I'm going to be talking to you about tonight. I had hoped tonight to share with you the, what the new paper was going to be, but it just got rejected a few months ago. And uh, maybe next time I'll <laughs> give you the report on that. But let's talk about what the position paper says in, in this national organization of top nutritional scientists. The Academy position paper on vegetarian nutrition, which states it is the position, and at that time it's called the American Dietetic Association, that appropriately planned vegetarian diets, including total vegetarian and vegan diets, are healthful, nutritionally adequate and may provide health benefits in the prevention and treatment of certain diseases. This was a really strong statement when this came out. For the first time, vegan was even mentioned in this, in this organization and it's showing and, and very strongly proclaiming that you can meet all your nutritional needs by being on these different types of vegetarian diets. And then it goes on to say that well-planned vegetarian diets are appropriate for individuals during all all stages of the life cycle, including pregnancy, lactation, infancy, childhood, and adolescence, and also for athletes. You know, some of these categories, sometimes uh, doctors would say, well, you can't be pregnant and be on a vegetarian diet, or you can't, you know, if you're an athlete, you can't really perform well on a vegetarian diet. Well, this organization here, the Academy, is saying that you can per per uh, be on this type of diet and still achieve optimal health. Now, probably the, the number one concern that people have today, they always ask you, well, where do you get your protein, right? That's the, probably the number one question. Well, in the position paper, it points out that plant proteins can meet the requirements when a variety of plant foods is consumed and the energy needs are met. In other words, as long as you're eating enough calories and you're eating a well variety, a, a diet that has a lot of variety, you're going to meet all your protein requirements. And research indicates that an assessment of plant food eaten over the course of a day can provide all the essential amino acids 
and ensure adequate nitrogen retention and use in the healthy for healthy adults thus complementary proteins do not need to be consumed at the same meal now before this position paper came out with this official statement many people including registered dietitians said well you have to have beans and rice at the same meal to complement them to get all your essential amino acids well the science the state of the science shows that you don't have to do that you can get all your amino acids as long as you're eating a healthy balanced diet with lots of variety throughout the whole day so here we see you don't have to do the complementary protein unfortunately still today there are still registered dietitians telling people that you have to do that but the science shows that that is not necessary eating the variety from all the different legumes and beans uh, nuts seeds uh, even broccoli and green leafy vegetables have good protein as long as you're getting a variety of this throughout the day you'll meet all your nutritional needs as far as the essential proteins omega-3 fatty acids is another area that has come up recently and uh, this n3 fatty acids means omega-3 fatty acids the essential fats it says, whereas vegetarian diets are generally rich in omega-6 fatty acids, the other types of fats, they may be marginal in omega-3 fatty acids. Now that is pointing out that not all vegetarians, because vegetarians don't eat fish, and they don't eat a lot of the foods that have omega-3 fatty acids sometimes, that uh, they may be lower compared to the general population. Diets that do not include fish, eggs, or generous amounts of algae generally are low in eicosapentaenoic acid, or EPA, and do docosahexaenoic acid, which is DHA, fatty acids, which are important for cardiovascular health as well as eye and brain development. There's no question these fats play a role in cardiovascular health as well as in the development of your eye and vision and also the brain. So, yes, Typical vegetarian diets are much lower in that. And then, but what we do as vegetarians, we bioconvert alpha-linolenic alpha acid, uh, which is an essential fatty acid, ALA, from different plant foods, and they're converted into fatty acids of EPA. But generally, it's only about 10% in humans that's actually converted from ALA to the DHA, which is substantially less. There we go. Vegetarians and particularly vegans tend to have lower levels of EPA and DHA than non-vegetarians because we don't eat all the fish, right? Now, of course, today there are DHA supplements now that are derived from microalgae that you can see in the health food stores are, that are very well absorbed and positively influence blood levels of DHA and also EPA through this what we call retroconversion. So now today through technology and these, these uh, uh, microalgae components of DHA can be included in a lot of different food products such as soy milk and breakfast bars and they're fortified with a vegetarian or a vegan form of DHA that's now available in the marketplace and this is an example of one that you see sometimes it'll say you know that it has EPA or omega-3 fatty acids so uh, it's perfectly possible today to get all your essential fatty acids including the omega-3 fatty acids and DHA in your diet in many of vegetarian food products today now vegetarians should also include sources of uh, ALA in their diets such as flaxseed walnuts uh, if you use oil, canola oil contributes some of this, uh, and also soy, soy products. The word those is spelled wrong, I notice there. Those with increased requirements of omega-3 fatty acids, such as pregnant women and also lactating women, can also benefit by getting some of these DHA supplements. Any of you use DHA supplements at all? T take additional mess? Okay, because you're breastfeeding and so forth? Okay. Now here's walnuts, you know a quarter uh, cup of walnuts, you're going to get all these essential fatty acids that you need. I think Dr. Esselstyn brings up the point that even five walnuts will provide you with really the essential fatty acids that you need. And then maybe two tablespoons of, um, of um, flax seeds also have great source of these omega-3s. Now one thing about flax seeds, you have to make sure 
that you run them through the little grinder to break those seeds because otherwise those seeds are just going to go through your body and you're not even going to absorb those essential fatty acids. So you want to have the ground flax seed and it's better to do it fresh, to do it, make it at home as opposed to buy it in the uh, bag unless it's refrigerated because these oils and the essential fats break down very easily. So it's better to make it fresh. What about iron? Iron is another nutrient that is often uh, of somewhat concern with vegetarians or discussed or some controversy over. Now the iron in plant foods is what we know as non-heme iron. Heme iron is the iron that you get from blood. How many of you like blood? <laughs> well of course that's a very readable, reliable source of absorbing your iron from blood but so vegetarians are going are to get it from uh, a non-heme iron source. And, and these non-heme iron sources are quite sensitive to things that we find in foods that inhibit their absorption and even things that enhance the iron absorption. In inhibitors of iron absorption include phytates. These are phytic acids that you find in whole grains. And in the plant-based diet, some of the, too much of the phytic acid can actually inhibit some of your absorption of iron. Uh, there's also calcium, too much calcium inhibits absorption of iron and certain polyphenolic compounds like if you're drinking lots of regular tea or coffee, even some of the polyphenols that you find in herb teas and cocoa can inhibit iron absorption. So while phytochemicals and the polyphenolics are very healthy for us in one way, it does have some inhibitory factors in, on iron. And fiber only slightly inhibits iron absorption. A lot of people in the past would say, oh, fiber foods, you, it, they counteract the, the ability for you to absorb iron, which is not, not really true. It's a very small amount. And vitamin C, eating more fruits and vegetables, particularly fresh fruits and vegetables, and other organic acids that we find in produce actually help, can substantially enhance the absorption of iron and reduce the in inhibitory effects of the phytates, thereby improving iron status. So very important to eat lots of the fresh fruits and vegetables. That's where the raw food type of uh, diet comes in, is that this vitamin C will help you to absorb your iron much better. And because of the lower bioavailability, uh, bioavailability of iron from a vegetarian diet, uh, it's recommended that the intake of um, vegetarians are 1.8 times um, those of the non-vegetarian. The, the recommended uh, intake of iron for non-vegetarians is 18 milligrams and it's recommended that uh, vegetarians and vegans maybe try to strive to get closer to 32 milligrams because of some of these inhibitory things that we may get from other plant foods. Now the incidence of iron deficiency anemia among vegetarians is very similar to non-vegetarians. So here again we're getting we can get our iron and the incidence of uh, deficiency is very similar. Although vegetarian diets have lower iron intakes than non-vegetarians, their serum ferritin levels, which is the measure that we look at in the blood test, are usually within the normal range. So it's just eating a good variety of whole foods that you're going to make sure you get your iron. Zinc is another nutrient that's sometimes brought in question. The bioavailability of zinc from vegetarian diets is lower uh, than from non-vegetarian diets. And this is mainly due to, the, again, the phytic acid the, that you find seems to inhibit the uh, intake of zinc. Uh, zinc re requirements for vegetarians whose diets consist mainly of phytic acid rich unrefined grains and legumes may exceed the uh, recommended dietary allowance. So anyway, you can get zinc from a, a variety of different um, plant foods as well, whole grains and others. But the, the one thing I want you to point out is that overt zinc deficiency is not really evident in Western vegetarians. So people in the United States who are eating vegetarian diets, we don't really see um, high levels of zinc deficiencies. Now what are some zinc sources? Soy products, legumes, grains, cheese, of course you don't have to eat cheese, but that is a source for the lacto-ovo vegetarian. Nuts uh, are very high in zinc. Brazil nuts are, by the way, one of the better ones. 
food preparation techniques such as soaking and sprouting beans, grains, and seeds, as well as leavening bread can reduce binding of zinc by phytic acid and increase the bioavailability of zinc. So these are some things you can do to increase the uh, bioavailability of zinc in those types of foods. Iodine, uh, some studies actually have suggested that vegans who do not uh, consume key sources of iodine such as iodized salt or sea vegetables may be at risk at iodine deficiency uh, because plant-based uh, diets are typically low in iodine. Of course seaweed and sea vegetation which a lot of people eat here in Hawaii is a very good source of natural iodine. Uh, iodine intake from sea vegetables should be monitored because the iodine content of sea vegetables uh, varies widely in, in different amounts and can contain substantial amounts as well, some, depending on the type of seaweed that you may be having. But some of the good sources of iodine from foods include soybeans, cruciferous vegetables, sweet potatoes, and, um, and, and some of these foods have natural goitrogens in them. So these are uh, things that inhibit iodine from being absorbed and causing uh, thyroid insufficiency in some people. Calcium, another thing that people bring up. What about calcium? Well, calcium uh, intakes in lacto-ovo vegetarians are similar or to or higher than those of the non-vegetarian, whereas in vegans it tends to be lower than both groups and they may fall under, the, under what you know, the high recommendations that they give. Uh, diets rich in meat, though, and fish and dairy products uh, and certain nuts and grains produce a high renal acid load. So when you're eating lots of these animal products, you, you, the acidity goes up in your, in what we call the renal acid load. And this is mainly due to the sulfate and phosphate residues that's caused by these types of products. But calcium reabsorption from bone helps to buffer that acid load, resulting in increased urinary losses of calcium. And um, so in other words, by eating too much of these animal products, you make the blood more acidic and your body tries to buffer that and it draws it from the bone, which is not a good thing and that's, that's where we promote osteoporosis. Fruits and vegetables that are rich in potassium and magnesium produce a high renal alkaline load. These are more alkalinizing foods which slows bone calcium reabsorption and decreases calcium loss through the urine. So eating more of the alkaline-based diet, which is a healthy plant-based diet, is the way to go. And this whole thing on trying to get lots of calcium, it's really, uh, we're eating too much animal products, making our blood more acidic and having to buffer it with the bone. In fact, I don't know if you know this, but it's been said that about 60% of the calcium that the average American eats is flushed down the toilet because of the high protein diets that Americans eat today. Of course, greens, Green leafy vegetables, broccoli, bok choy, these foods are very rich in calcium that's highly absorbable, particularly the low oxalate greens. Now spinach, on the other hand, has a lot of oxalic acid which inhibits the calcium from being absorbed. But the low oxalic greens, such as bok choy, uh, broccoli, Chinese cabbage, collards and kale, and fruit juices that have been fortified with calcium citrate malate, which is one of the more absorbable form of calciums, are are good sources of highly bioavailable calcium. While calcium set tofu, cow's milks have, they, there's good bioavailability in some of those, although there's question about the high protein in cow's milk, if that is really as bioavailable as we, we, we think it is. Sesame seeds, almonds, and dried beans actually have less bioavailability of calcium compared to, to these green leafy vegetables. So greens is where it's really at. The bioavailability of calcium from soy milk fortified with calcium carbonate is equivalent to, this, to what compared to calcium in milk from cows. However, limited research has shown that calcium bioavailability is substantially less when tricalcium phosphate is used to fortify soy milks. So when you look for uh, soy milk, look for the one that's been uh, fortified with calcium carbonate as opposed to tricalcium phosphate. Oxalate, you've heard of oxalic acid, which is high in spinach and Swiss chard particularly. Uh, these can 
greatly reduce calcium absorption and making these vegetables really a poor use of, of calcium. Although they're good for beta carotene and other nutrients, uh, they don't rely on calcium. Vitamin D. Here in Hawaii, we don't really have to worry about vitamin D because we get, our, we get sunshine. But uh, uh, of course, sunshine is a natural way of getting exposed to vitamin D. You know, works on a certain type of cholesterol on your skin, converts it into vitamin D. Uh, foods that are fortified with vitamin D uh, include cow's milk, but then there's also now, today, you get the rice milks, the soy milks, uh, orange juice, uh, some of the breakfast cereals have vitamin D. I don't recommend margarine, but I know they do put it in margarine. Soy milks now have plenty of vitamin D in it, and that can help you with the absorption of calcium. Vitamin B12 is another nutrient that, of course, particularly amongst vegans, that we need to be uh, watchful of. The B12 status of some vegetarians is less than adequate due to not regularly consuming reliable sources of vitamin B12. Uh, for vegans, vitamin B12 must be obtained from the regular use of vitamin B12 fortified foods, such as soy milk or rice milk, some breakfast cereals, some of the meat, uh, vegetarian meat substitutes, of course they add vitamin B12 too as well. Red Star Vegetarian Nutritional Yeast is also a good source uh, of vitamin B12. Bragg, we put out a nutritional yeast that each uh, tablespoon has 40% of the daily value of vitamin B12. So you have a little bit of that and you have some other types of foods, you're going to get all the vitamin B12 that you need. Although if you really want to uh, assure that you're getting the B12, you may want to take a vitamin B12 supplement uh, daily that contains 100% uh, of the daily value of vitamin B12 uh, as a, just a nutritional insurance. Now let's talk about vegetarian diets through the life cycle because this is an area that many people are concerned about. As you go from birth all the way to old age, can you adequately get all the nutrients that you need on a vegetarian and vegan diet? Well, according to the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, well-planned vegan, lacto-ovo, and lacto-ovo-vegetarian, lacto-vegetarian diets are appropriate for all stages of the life cycle, including pregnancy and lactation. Uh, properly planned vegan, lacto-vegetarian, and lacto-ovo-vegetarian diets satisfy the nutrient needs for infants, children, and adolescents that promote normal growth. It really upsets me when I hear people tell me that their doctor said, you got to feed your children meat or they're not going to grow properly. You ever hear that? Medical doctors telling parents that and uh, it scares the parents. But here, through this document, through this position paper, you can take it into the doctor and show them here's the scientific evidence where you're getting that type of information. Vegetarian children and adolescents have lower intakes of cholesterol, saturated fat, and total fat, and higher intakes of fruits, vegetables, and fiber than non-vegetarians. So you're eliminating a lot of the common problems today leading to heart disease, and I have to tell you, we're in a serious situation now with children eating all this saturated fat and cholesterol. Today we're finding children as young as seven who are, uh, have adult onset diabetes. You have an idea when we start seeing the beginnings of atherosclerosis, at what age we find that scene in the artery walls? Anyone have an idea? Six? Actually at age three we start seeing the beginnings of streaking. And where, why is that? Because what are the parents feeding them? Whole milk, McDonald's, all this type of saturated fat and cholesterol containing foods from animal sources. Pregnant and lactating women. Vegetarian diets can be planned to meet the nutrient needs of pregnant and lactating women. And I, I see a woman back there, one of our members here, breastfeeding and giving them good nutrition. Uh, Breastfed infants whose mothers do not have adequate intake of B12 should receive a vitamin B12 supplement and that way the infant will get the B12 through the mother's milk. And it's so wonderful now to see in the health food stores and down to earth who's, who's here tonight having all these great vegan, vegetarian, baby food products, organic uh, it's wonderful to see all the variety of baby food products that are out there to help uh, those who are raising their children to be vegetarians and vegans. 
Children, growth for lact of lacto-ovo-vegetarian is similar to that of their non-vegetarian peers. So when it comes to lacto-ovo-vegetarians, it's almost identical as far as growth patterns. Some studies suggest that vegan children tend to be slightly smaller, but within the normal ranges of the standards of weight and height. Sometimes the vegan children may grow a little bit slower. They're not getting those high protein diets, which promotes rapid growth and aging actually. So they may grow a little bit slower, but by the time that they get older, they're at, the they're at normal uh, height ranges that they should be. I, I love to see these kids learn about healthy vegan vegetarian diets and getting them on plant-based diets. This is the most important thing you can do. My daughter, we raised Jasmine on a vegan diet right from the beginning. There she is. <laughs> So those of you that are parents, I commend you for raising your kids on these healthy diets because in the long run, they're going to live longer, healthier lives. Vegan children may have slightly higher protein needs because of differences in protein digestibility and amino acid composition, but these protein needs are generally met when diets contain adequate energy and a variety of plant foods. In other words, it's easier to absorb the protein and, and break down the amino acids from animal foods because it's kind of pre-done for you. You're getting it second hand. But when you're eating these plant foods, there's, little, there's some inhibitory factors or it's not, it's not absorbed as well. But as long as you're getting a wide variety of these plant foods and you're meeting the caloric needs, uh, you're gonna get all the adequate protein you really need. Uh, for adolescents and teenagers, growth of lacto-ovo-vegetarian and non-vegetarian adolescents are, this, are similar. And uh, this is the age that, uh, unfortunately, the teenagers are eating diets that aren't too healthy. And uh, vegetarian diets appear to offer some nutritional advantages for teenagers and adolescents. Ve vegetarian adolescents are reported to consume more fiber, more iron, folate, vitamin A, and vitamin C than non-vegetarians. Think about that. These, these, all these nutrients, they're getting more than the non-vegetarians because they're eating more of a whole food, plant-based diet. Vegetarian adolescents also consume more fruits and vegetables and fewer sweets, fast foods, and sl salty snacks compared to non-vegetarian adolescents. Now I have to qualify this a little bit is that I do have a concern that today a lot of uh, kids are becoming vegans for animal right reasons, which that's a good cause, but they don't realize uh, that they, they're, not, they're not doing it for healthful reasons. So they tend to eat more of these vegan cookies and, and junk foods, I call it, vegan junk foods, that may be not the best for their health and don't supply the nutrients their body really needs. Now, I remember when I was at Veg uh, Veggie Life magazine, we had a, a magazine that really promoted vegan diets and vegetarian diets, and uh, they, I was criticized when I was nutrition editor there because I was making the foods too healthy. They said, we're, you're, we got letters from vegans saying, oh, after Westerdahl came on as vegetarian nutrition editor, there's two, the foods are too healthy, the recipes. And they said, we became vegans because we're interested in animal rights. We want more of those uh, cookies and pastry type vegan recipes. We don't want all this healthy stuff. So anyway, when I'm, when I'm told that by some vegan friends and young people, I say, so you're for animal rights, right? Yes. And you're an animal, aren't you? Yes. Well, when you eat junk food, vegan foods, that's animal abuse, right? They never thought of it that way. But you got, it all starts with yourself. So um, in the growing trend of more people becoming vegans, particularly with teenagers for animal rights, we want to make sure that we encourage them to eat healthy vegan foods because that's supplying the nutrients that their body needs. Key nutrients of concern for adolescent vegetarians include calcium, vitamin D, iron, zinc, and vitamin B12, but if as long as you're getting a wide variety, here again, of the different foods, they're going to meet all the nutritional needs. Older adults, here again, I have heard of doctors that tell seniors that are in their 80s, you got to get off that vegetarian diet, you need to eat more animal protein. Have you heard that? They say that with older people. 
Well, with aging, energy needs decrease, but recommendations for several nutrients, including calcium, vitamin D, vitamin B6, and higher intake of micronutrients, especially calcium, zinc, iron, vitamin B12, decline in older adults. Studies indicate that older vegetarians have dietary intakes that are similar to non-vegetarians. So even those that are eating a wide variety of plant-based foods can have a dietary intake similar for those nutrients as long as healthy. Athletes, vegetarian diets can also meet the needs of competitive athletes. Uh, nutrition recommendations for vegetarian athletes should be formulated and for, with consideration for the effects on both vegetarian diets and exercise. And you're going to see today, you know, it used to be said that you can't be a bodybuilder and be a vegan. Well, that's not necessarily true. There are quite a few vegan bodybuilders out there today. It really has to do with the training. That's the key part of it. And as long as you're getting your protein, whether it's from beans or whatever it is, uh, you know, whatever the plant food is, that will give you your nutrient needs. Now I want to just mention about chronic disease prevention and uh, treatment with vegetarian diets. The key thing I want you to remember is that foods from plants prevent the diseases that are killing us. Fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and beans. To me, this is the medicine of the future. This is what we call lifestyle medicine and plant foods and a plant-based diet plays a key role in the future of medicine. We got to get our doctors thinking this way more. Uh, eating more of these foods. And we know for, for ischemic heart disease, a vegetarian diet is associated with lower risk of death from ischemic heart disease, atherosclerosis, and, and so forth. Blood lipid levels, the lower risk of death from ischemic heart disease risk seen in vegetarians could be explained in part due to the blood levels of the cholesterol, the LDL cholesterol, and so forth. Hypertension, lower rate of hypertension among vegetarians. I had uh, some interesting uh, statistics here on that, pointing out that um, compared to meat eaters, lifelong vegetarians have 24% reduced risk uh, incidents, I should say, of ischemic heart disease, and lifelong vegans have a 57% per, lower incidence of ischemic heart disease compared to meat eaters. So that, that's very powerful. Of course, saturated fat, primarily in animal food products. Of course, they're promoting coconut oil today, which I'm not a big fan of. It's still saturated fat. But we uh, want to stay away from these foods because saturated fats raise cholesterol, increasing your risk of heart disease. And remember, plant foods, fruits, nuts, grains, vegetables, all plant foods have zero cholesterol. It's only found in animal food products. Here you have a cross-section of a artery and you can see the buildup of the plaque along the walls of the artery to where you have up to 99% plugged up buildup of cholesterol plaque. And as I mentioned, we see the beginnings of this process even at age three in the average American. So we need to be aggressive on this and there's no reason to have heart disease. If you raise your children on this type of all plant-based diet, there's no reason they should ever have a heart attack, really. And the scientific research supports this. And many of you know of Dr. Dean Ornish's work, uh, where he put people on an all plant-based diet, um, uh, and it was low, very low-fat vegetarian diet, and 82% of the patients actually had reversal of the plaque buildup of on the, their arteries. And here's the PET scan that showed it. Uh, on the left hand side you see when the patient started out at the beginning and one year later this is a PET scan of the heart showing the circulation and on the right side you can see the more red and yellow color there inc shows that those arteries opened up, there was more circulation, there was actually reversal of atherosclerosis on, on a low fat uh, vegetarian diet. Vegetarians appear to consume more phytochemicals than do non-vegetarians because of a greater percentage of their energy and calories coming from plant foods. And these include flavonoids and other phytochemicals which appear to have protective effects 
as antioxidants in reducing platelet aggregation, in other words, in reducing those blood cells from sticking together and forming clots and blood clots, and they have anti-inflammatory agents in these plant foods and in improving the endothelial function of, of our bodies. Antioxidants, of course, we know that story, eating more fruits and vegetables, the more color, and why we say eat a rainbow of colors, that, that's, that, that's better. Again, remember, foods from plants prevent the diseases that are killing us. Now, why are plant foods so important? They're low in fat generally, except for coconut and avocado and nuts, but most plant foods are very low in fat. They're high in fiber. Fiber that can help you lower your cholesterol. Fiber that can also help you uh, prevent colon cancer. They're low in calories and filling up more on these foods make you not want to eat as much of the bad type of food. So that's important. And they're loaded with these wonderful phytochemicals and antioxidants. This is just a list of some of the different types of antioxidants that we find in plant foods. Of course, vitamin C and E and all these colorful pigments carotenoids, alpha and beta carotene, lycopene, lutein, and then we find the flavonoid compounds, which are pigments, which are the reds and purples and blues and, and the whites. All these things have very powerful effects on the body in fighting against disease. Phytochemicals. Okay, I want to just mention diabetes. The Seventh-day Adventist population, where approximately 50% of the Seventh-day Adventists follow vegetarian diets. Well, the Adventist vegetarians are reported to have lower rates of diabetes compared to the non-Adventist uh, vegetarians when they compare the two within the group. And higher intakes of vegetables and whole grains and legumes and beans and nuts have all been associated through the scientific literature with a substantially lower risk of insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes and improved glycemic control in either normal or insulin resistant individuals. When it comes to obesity, of course, the Adventist population has been the biggest population studied as far as uh, vegetarian diets, but it shows they have about 30% of whom follow a meatless diet. It's actually 30 to 50%. Vegetarians' eating patterns have been associated with lower BMI and BMI increase as the frequency of meat consumption is increased in both men and women. Now, cancer, the big C. Vegetarians tend to have an overall cancer rate lower than that of the general population, and this is not uh, just confined to, to smoking-related cancers. You know, every aspect, every phase going through the progression of cancer, from the normal cell going to precancer, going to cancer, going to invasive cancer, fruits and vegetables have powerful components of antioxidants and phytochemicals and other properties that we don't even know all about today in breaking that chain reaction. So that's why it's important that you just eat, just flood your body with lots of fruits and vegetables. As I mentioned, the Seventh-day Adventist population who they don't smoke, a lot of them are vegetarians, have significantly less rates of uh, cancer. When it comes to osteoporosis, dairy products, green leafy vegetables, and calcium fortified plant foods um, do provide calcium. Of course, we're, we're trying to get more of the plant foods, and osteoporosis is a big problem. But as I mentioned earlier, it has a lot to do with eating those high animal products, promoting the acidity in the blood and your bone trying to buffer that acidity. Renal disease, kidney disease, also related to eating too much animal protein. Soy-based vegan diets appear to be nutritionally adequate for people with chronic kidney disease and may slow the progression of kidney disease. Dementia, the brain, uh, and everyone's interested in you know, brain nutrition is quite a topic today. And there's some studies to show that vegetarians are at lower risk of developing deme dementia compared to non-vegetarians. And this reduced risk is believed to be in lower blood pressure and because of the increased amounts of antioxidants that vegetarians get in their diet. So in concluding what the state of the science is saying from the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, the leading organization in the world of nutrition, when they look at vegetarian diets, they have three main conclusions. One, 
Appropriately planned vegetarian diets have been shown to be healthful, nutritionally adequate, and may be beneficial in the prevention and treatment of certain diseases. The second point, vegetarian diets are appropriate for all stages of life. There are many reasons for, uh, for the rising of interest of vegetarian diets, whether it's ecological or health or animal rights, there's many reasons, but they are appropriate for whatever stage of life you find yourself in. And the third conclusion is that the number of vegetarians in the United States is expected to increase during the next decade. Food and nutrition professionals can assist vegetarian clients by providing current accurate information about vegetarian nutrition foods and, and resources that they can get. Now, I would like to refer you to this website. You want to, might want to write it down. This is from the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, the Vegetarian uh, Practice Group, vegetariannutrition.net. It's a very reliable source of, of good scientific information about vegetarian nutrition. There's a lot of great recipes and other things to help you get on a healthy vegetarian diet and lifestyle. I want to mention also, I do have my national radio show that you can go and learn, learn more about uh, vegetarian nutrition. I have a lot of great interviews, uh, handouts, materials, and that's at healthandlongevityradio.com. Health and, and you can hear some of my past radio shows. I've had all the leaders in the vegetarian movement on, Dr. Esselstyn, Dr. McDougall, T. Colin Campbell, and many others. Thank you, Dr. John Westerdahl, for this really wonderful presentation from an insider's point of view. And we appreciate getting all these useful details from the latest position paper on uh, vegetarian diets from the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics from you. Thank you so much. Um, we'd like to now invite all of you to enjoy some tasty vegan dishes courtesy of Down to Earth. Thank you again very much Dr. John Westerdahl and mahalo to all of you for coming and have a safe return home. Good night everyone. This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and helpful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website, at www.vsh.org vsh.org